Okay, so, so as I said, we had some good discussions and I hope we're going to have the same today. Today we're going to focus a lot more on um, assessment and activities. And at the end of today, we're hoping to have a product. Uh, the question yesterday was why, um, I think two people asked this today, why were you asked to bring your content and we did not use it? So we are using it today. So yesterday was all the thinking behind it and even today thinking behind assessments and that sort of thing. But we want to actually come up with a product by the end of today. And, and I'm hoping that um, I can also just give you, we were talking about individual attention, but I'm hoping that I can come around why you're busy um, and, and assist if need be. Or if you just want to ask me a question or my opinion on something, whatever. Okay, but you're going to be, there's going to be a lot less talking today. Um, however, I, I think uh, Jake wants to do a short presentation, is that correct? Yes. Are you also doing something fake with no. it? Okay, so Dave will do something with you later on. Um, and then yesterday, remember, I showed you this video. I couldn't get it to work, but I'm using my data from my iPad. I tried to do a hotspot yesterday. It just wouldn't work. But it, when it's plugged in, it works fine. So hopefully we'll just start off with that video. And then um, I also just want to say that but I don't know if you all heard about the, the survey and the 10,000 rand uh, <laughs> incentive for one person. Did you all hear that? No. No. <laughs> but it's not the, that survey. That's <laughs> not the <laughs> survey. I oh, wanted honestly, to say. I already said it. I would share with my colleagues if I want. So, um, <laughs> I think that is just, they can give you a hand. Yeah, anyway, I think that's exactly, it just proves that I'm the best so choice. So, for my survey... Yes, yes, I just told, I just answered you. No problem. Thanks, thanks. Good morning. <laughs> okay, so for my survey, unfortunately, there is no incentive. Maybe... The incentive, and I don't know if that's incentive or punishment, but um, we're thinking of, uh, based on the, the results that come out of the survey, we would do, and it's on professional development, continuous professional development. So based on that, we want to have some kind of intervention, so we would come in as this is uh, another project that I'm working on for OER Africa. Remember we spoke about OER and all of that, open learning principles. So it's, it's more for that project. So we would come in and we would not charge VUT or anything, but we would come and do a pilot project, some sort of intervention. If people say, this is the need, and then we try and have some sort of intervention around that need. So maybe that's the incentive there. But um, but you can tell you more about the other survey and that incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, Faith, do you want to just... Oh, okay, you know, there's a um, countrywide survey that is run by CPUT and um, they want to add to the institutional performance indicators. Another performance indicator that relates to the use of technology um, for teaching and learning and the impact that technology has on teaching and learning. So the person at CPU <coughs> told me that it's because it's related to technology and teaching and learning, if I send the survey, he survey out to people, to the lecturers, then I must make some criteria and choose one person that is going to give 10,000 credit for completing the survey at each institution, at each of the UOTs. That's what Najma is talking about. So he's going to send it to me, and then I'm going to send it out to all of you people, and <clears throat> then I'll ask him if I can limit it to a certain number of people, because I must determine who's the 10,000 grand winner. So I said to him, I'm going to put all of the things through, because he must send it in Blackboard, and the survey must be in Butella, and then I'm going to put the results through SPSS to make a discrimination value, 
to see who's got the highest um, when the answers are closer to what the majority of people answer for that question, because the service is not true and false, but some discrimination thing. And then from there, let the machine calculate who has got the highest discrimination value in most, in most of the questions, and then we'll get the person as the winner. But because of, in the light of what Derek said yesterday, that it must incentivize you people, I was thinking that maybe if I could play a little trick and then only send the survey only out to the 30 people, or the people in this module, so then you stand a bigger chance of getting the 10,000. So that's my idea. <laughs> I'll add to that idea. I think I should just pull that idea. <laughs> and then in the answer to your equation, you can just put Dr. Sharp there. <laughs> Okay, I'd, anyway, so I thought we'll just uh, start off with this uh, video and then I'm hoping to just give you, <coughs> where's the survey, uh, just 10 minutes to complete the survey um, and, and please note that it is completely voluntary so you don't have to do it, I'll, I'll just send it around and I'll Give you 10 minutes and collect at the end if you don't want to do it. It's, it's entirely up to you. I don't, you know, no compulsion. Anyway, and this is also just to give um, Derek time. Uh, I'm sure he's on his way. He probably, um, yeah, maybe he's just stuck in traffic or something. Um, so then I will start off, I think, until tea time. And then um, Derek needs to also then do some sort of presentation with you. Um, I'm hoping that after that presentation, uh, we'll just uh, have maybe another half an hour of discussion and whatever, but then we need to get into your individual activities. Okay. So, here we go with, I hope the sound is okay though, I didn't bring external speakers. So you want to Oh, it's quite soft. Let me tell you what society can tell you. It increases your chance of getting the job. It provides you an opportunity to be successful. Your life will be a lot less stressful. Sorry, I just want to stop quickly. Are you able to even hear that? No. Okay, let's, okay, let's start with the survey and then we'll try and get external speakers. Sorry about that, uh, but if you can't, then it's fine. It's just, yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, 
in.
Sorry? One more. I'm so sorry, I don't have more copies, but I see these a few people that's not completing. Is it okay if we, shall we? We can write more for you. If you give us the, uh, for No, no, I don't. Do we have a clean coffee still? No, it's not clean. Oh, oh okay. Oh, these, these one. This one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry, can I just if, if you don't mind for the three of you as well? Thank you. Okay, so.
Yeah. Have you got one? Yeah, please. Oh, do you one? Got one. He's got one. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll we'll listen to the not listen, we'll watch the video quickly. As you can see it's six minutes and seven seconds, which is quite long. We don't have to go to the end. I think let's just go halfway and then we'll see. We might just uh, listen to the first three minutes only. Okay. Sorry about that. Increase your at the job, provides you with an opportunity to be successful. Your life will be a lot less stressful. Education is the key. Now let me tell you what your parents will tell you. Make me proud. Increases your chances of getting a job. Provides you with an opportunity to be successful. Your life will be a lot less stressful. Education is the key. Now let's look at the statistics. Steve Jobs, net worth, seven billion, RIP. Richard Branson, net worth, 4.2 billion. Oprah Winfrey, net worth, 2.7 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, Henry Ford, Steven Spielberg, Bill Gates. Now here comes the coup, the grace. <coughs> Looking at these individuals, what's your conclusion? Neither of them in being successful ever graduated from a higher learning institution. Now some of you will protest like, you know money is only the medium by which one measures worldly success. And some of you will even have the nerve to say, I don't do it for the money. So what are you studying for? To work for a charity? Need more clarity? Let's look at the statistics. Jesus, Muhammad Ibn and Socrates, Malcolm X, Mother Teresa, Spielberg, Shakespeare, Beethoven, Jesse Owens, Muhammad Ali, Sean Carter, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, Michael Joseph Jackson, were either of these people unsuccessful or uneducated? All I'm saying is that if there was a family tree, hard work and education would be related, but school would probably be a distant cousin. If education is the key, the school is the lock. Because it really has the mind to the point where it can perceive red as green and continue to go when someone else said stop. Because as long as you follow the rules and pass the exams, you're cool. But are you aware that examiners have a checklist? And if your answer is something outside of the box, the automatic response is across. And then they claim that school expands your horizons and your visions. Well, tell that to Malcolm X who dropped out of school and is well renowned for what he learned in a prison. Proverbs 17, 16. It doesn't fall no good to spend money on education. Why? Because he has no common sense. George Bush, need I say more? Education is about inspiring one's mind, not just filling their head. And take this from me because I'm an educated man myself who only came to this realization after countless nights in the library with a can of Red Bull keeping me awake till dawn and another can in the morn, falling asleep in between piles of books which probably equate to the same amount I had spent on my rent, memorize equation, facts and dates right down to the letter, half of which I never remember and half of which I forget straight after the exam and before the start of the next semester, asking anyone if they had notes for the last lecture. I often found myself running to class just so I could find a spot on which I could rest my head and fall asleep without making a scene. I run it, because that's the only time I ever spent in university chasing my dreams. And then after nights with a dead mind, I then find myself in a queue of half awake student zombies waiting to hand in an assignment. Maybe that's why they called it a deadline. <laughs> and then after three years of mental suppression and frustration, my proud mother didn't even turn up to my graduation. Now, I'm not saying that school is evil and there's nothing to gain. But all I'm saying is understand your motives and reassess your aims. Because if you want a job working for someone else, then help yourself. But then that would be a contradiction because you wouldn't really be helping yourself if you help with somebody else. There's a saying which says, if you don't build your dream, someone else will hire you to help build theirs. It increases your chances of getting a job. Sorry, sorry. I thought I'm going to stop at that point, um, unless you want to watch the rest, <laughs> another two minutes. But um, just your impressions. 
I mean, he's, he's made a couple of very controversial statements. Mm -hmm. I don't think he understands statistics. <laughs> Because yeah. if you take uneducated people, 99.99% yeah. are in poverty. Yes. It's the exceptions. Yeah, it's being, the exceptions. Where if you take educated people, yeah, maybe we're not earning that, but at least we're not earning nothing. Mm. We're, we're middle class. Mm. And yes, we're back to middle class, but at least we are middle class. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's about considering the whole picture and not just focusing on a few odd successful ones. Okay. And just to uh, add to what uh, our colleague has said, um, if you look at all of those, Beethoven, uh, Steve Jobs, all of those guys had a fundamental understanding, mm. so there was some form of education that has taken place, mm. and they've just mm. taken what they have learned and run with. Yeah. So they're not entirely uneducated. Mm. Mm. So mm. I kind of agree with what you're saying, it's not... Yeah, so, so if we look at that, uh, the title, Why I Hate School But Love Education. So he's not, it's, he's not making the point about you don't need education, he's, he's making the point about schools and, and what we put our students through. And then um, I want to agree with you. Just in our own environment, we spend a lot of time in VUT making students fail. Mm. Because of this thing he's talking about, there's so much pressure on completing a task that nobody's given any time to learn anything. Yes, yes. 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 So, yeah, I don't know, for me that was the message more than, yeah, I agree with those people are the exceptions, not the rule. You know, the Steve Jobs of this world and Richard Branson's and all of those people. But um, if, if we look at it from that angle, school versus education. What are we doing to our students? Um, that for me just stood out um, with this, this video. You know what I think it is? And, I, and I've noticed it a lot in sort of the youth. Yeah. It's for them, it's, it's the higher education part because you look at celebrities, like the really wealthy celebrities, they never finish school. Yeah. So for them, it's like, why do I need to finish school mm. if I can still be successful? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts on, on the video? What we, what we do with our students while we have them in our care, so to, so to speak. When I was seeing my sister when she was doing her uh, VCOMs, she said, because you're educated, you become more adverse to what you're saying. The cost of this thing is more the more you are in. Yeah. So I think those are perhaps not all that extremely educated. It's easy for them to take a class. Okay. Anyway, I just thought that, that that would be a good way to start. Um, I mean, we can have a whole session and a whole debate because there are lots of other controversial issues that came out for me. But. Um, we we'll leave it at that. We're not going to belabor the point. Um, let me just get back to my presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you at this point, do you want to, to go now or a little bit later? I'm happy whatever we Okay. Your, your topic is? My topic is um, the idea of how do we take what you've talked about, creating blended learning, but then broaden it into the whole of the UT. Okay. And uh, amongst our fellow academics, and okay. then maybe into our research area as well. Okay. Okay, then I think maybe it's a good good point to bring yours in Thank now, you. and then we'll, we'll continue. Yeah. yeah.
Hello, everybody. Um, some folk, well, most of you recognize me, but those who don't, I'm Derek. Um, I'm part of this team that are, are trying to um, uh, get blended learning going. And, and whereas I think Najma and uh, Sadie are, are trying to um, engage around how do we start to think of uh, blended learning from a kind of professional uh, perspective, um, my question is broader than that. Um, and I'm going to be looking at how uh, we engage with students and how we engage with research around blended learning and how we engage with each other. So let me start off by saying I love Instagram because it's a wonderful way that organizations and people show the better part of their lives. On Instagram, everything is filtered, almost everything. And uh, most of the pictures are aspirational. They're things that we hope for ourselves or for our future or for our organizations. And so I went onto Instagram this weekend and checked out a couple of pictures. And the campus that I see on Instagram is a beautiful campus with uh, green lawns and, and, and uh, rising suns and uh, trees in order. And I also see on Instagram uh, new vice chancellors being inaugurated and students graduating and also new students coming in. And, and I'm not sure if anyone can tell me who that student is on the bottom right. Um, Anybody know? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, she is a, a young author who's from VUT. She just released a book. Um, if you go to the Instagram post, you'll see uh, she's got a great story about what she's been doing. And, and, and this, is, this is the public face of, of VUT. However, when I sit here with you, I hear a whole lot of, of, of different uh, issues. Now, these are not necessarily flattering photos, and I, 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 it will only be shown on here. We won't put it onto Instagram. <laughs> but um, <laughs> these are some of the things I heard from you yesterday. Was we have competing priorities. Our job is to push through students. Uh, we have students that really don't have the digital skills to do what we hope them to do online. Wi-Fi continues to be a problem, especially the way the building is built. It doesn't penetrate through uh, uh, concrete. Time. We're expected uh, to mark, to teach large classes, and now you're asking us to do uh, blended learning. Uh, you can't see the bottom, but it says packed curriculum. Uh, they are, they, we are expected to kind of go through a heck of a lot of content and um, there's no actual space to give people the opportunity to, to think, reflect, all of those kind of things that are, are necessary in a, a higher education environment. Motivation. Um, students are uh, here, um, but their motivation is probably not educational. Uh, these are some of the things that I heard. Uh, have I missed, missed out on any other of the kind of uh, problems that I, I hear? I'm, I'm sure there are others, but I think this tries to capture some of the issues that you are facing. Now, now we can, as I said yesterday, we can do two things. We can say, okay, to hell with it. We cannot do anything about it. Or we can say, okay, how do we deal with these problems? Okay, now what I think we need to understand is these problems are not problems that are unique to VUT. And what I did was, um, there's an interesting project called um, Unbundled, uh, in, what's it called? Unbundled Education. In, Unbundled in Higher Education. And they're looking particularly at South Africa and how uh, education, uh, higher education is becoming unbundled in that sense of where we once had a coherent campus experience where you came for three years and you went from first year all the way to third year, that's starting to, to come apart. And, and digital technology might have some kind of 
blame for it, but it, there are other factors that are, are doing that. And here are some of the key themes that we see in South Africa. Fees, every year since 2007 to now, are going eight, up 8.4% 8 across the country. Enrollment is going up 6% per annum. Fundum, funding, however, is uh, not keeping up. Per annum, it's only going up 5.4%. Third income stream, look at that, 0.2% per annum. Sorry, that's supposed to be NISFAS. Uh, um, maybe SAA might be related to it as well. Um, um, but NISFAS in 2014, 31% of student applications to NISFAS, these are valid applications, students that, students that come from a, a background where their family income is less than 20, the less than 122,000. 31% of those students were rejected. Okay, so so those are some of the things that we see broadly uh, in, in our in our universities. And then when it comes to digital, these are some of the things that we're seeing as well. Universities are choosing what are they going to invest their money in. Are they going to invest in hard or soft things? Hard things, technology infrastructure, handing out computers, handing out laptops or soft investments, professional development, community of practice, getting people to talk and uh, think and write and research about what they're doing. Um, there are questions about evidence of value. Um, is this actually worth our effort? Uh, are there, is there enough? I mean, these are questions as academics we're asking ourselves all the time. Uh, do faculty have enough time to do what we're asking them to do? Are they willing to do it? three main kind of issues that we have to face, the digital, uh, sorry, digital literacy, digital divide, and data divide. Okay, so, so these are, are themes that we're seeing uh, around our, ourselves. Okay, then the question we are looking at in particular is what is the role of the digital ecosystem in making quality education available to all equitably? There should be a question mark at the end of that. Okay. And, and, and you here, yeah, because you're looking at blended learning, are asking yourself all, that's, all those questions. And, and, and we know that technology does offer us a, a lot of things. Okay? It offers us flexible, small group, technology-enabled education. It gives us far more opportunities than, say, a straight lecture hall does. It also offers access and flexibility, and I think academia, particularly in South Africa, started to realize that with fees must fall. Now, I know in your context, fees must fall wasn't a big theme, but in the rest of, of uh, South African universities, particularly research-focused universities like UCT and WITS, they had up to then dismissed the role for, of technology, and suddenly they thought, oh crap, there is actually a place for technology in our education because it allowed students that wanted to carry on study to do so. And then these are, are, are some of the things that technology enables us. It allows us to both be both, both campus and online learning. It allows us to reconceptualize the curriculum. Yes, you can have a curriculum that looks exactly the same as it did in your face-to-face -face classroom and we would call that just replacing your curriculum. You can augment your curriculum with technology or you can transform it. If you put those three together you get the acronym RAT. Replace, augment, transform. Okay, These are questions again we're asking ourselves. Are we just replacing it or are we actually changing things? And if we sum those up into three themes they might be around pedagogy, learning spaces and technology. Okay, so I've thrown a whole lot of ideas at you, and what I'm asking you to start to tell me is what do you want, okay? Do you want all graduates to respond quickly and confidently to rapid changing technologies in their fields? Or do we want to focus narrowly onto postgraduate students and offer them digital learning students? Or do we just want to get uh, staff and students to look at their own curriculum and use digital technologies within it? Do we want to focus only on an enhanced learning experience for students at risk? Or do we want to just uh, want to focus on teaching excellence? I, I don't know where you want to, to focus, okay? But what I have been trying to suggest with my ideas around uh, Susan's and Robert's is we need to decide who are we looking at, okay? And if we want to really narrow it down, 
We can look at what we do for all students, what we do for targeted groups of students, what we do for at-risk students. Sorry, there are a hell of a lot of spelling errors here. I was doing this in a low light and in, in a shiny environment. What do we do for failing students? Okay, can you see what we're doing? We've got a triangle there. We've got something that's broadly offering everyone, or we might even be able to research a one master student who cannot understand percentage and ask them, ask why is that the case? Okay, and start unpacking that. Be because those are questions we as academics need to be asking, not just going... <laughs> okay, because that's what we do. We bash our heads against the table and we say, why? Okay, but we aren't taking it further. Okay, and this is the project I'm trying to ask, is how do we address some of these challenges. And remember the idea is again, we focus our attention on certain things. So maybe you want to look at solvable challenges, difficult challenges, or wicked challenges. Now, this is how I see them, but you will see them differently. I say a solvable challenge is support services and technology skills. Difficult challenge may be time management, connectivity, wicked challenge, are they self-directed? I don't know. You're going to have to decide what kind of challenges you want to deal with. And how are we going to deal with, well, we're going to engage. And the question is, is the zip going up or is the zip going down? Okay. Look, we can either go up and we can get our aspirational students to reach what they're aiming at. Or we can say, okay, things are going to be unbundled and things are going to be different. Uh, education is no longer going to be that experience that we had when we were students. Um, and, and I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong, but the question is, how do we start talking to students, to each other, to management about what we see happening? And I'd like us to really start thinking about three questions. How do we engage with students? How do we engage with each other? And how do we engage with the broader academia around these issues? And, and I'd like just some ideas from you. How do we engage with students, each other, and academia? Are we engaging with students? Not as much as we should, okay. It's bloody difficult to engage with students. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? You have, okay. Extreme. That's where you realize what the problems are in the undergrads. Okay, okay. Fabulous. Okay. Okay, so, so we, we're engaging with students. How are we engaging with each other with those problems or challenges we see amongst students? We got some really <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and that's for me the third question is how do we engage with academia or with research or with our broader academic responsibilities? Okay, not just teaching, but research, uh, engagement with the community. H how do we bring what we are seeing in our practice into our research? Now, I know many of you do fantastic research in the subject you are uh, PhD academics in. The question is, how do we also engage with our own teaching and learning practices? And, and Fai calls this a, the, the scholarship of teaching and learning. I call it just engagement. Uh, how do we connect uh, what our experience is with our academic mandate? And, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see if we can create a community of practice where we start, and it's happening already, we're starting to talk to each other about our frustrations. But then we're starting to say, okay, what do we do with these frustrations? How do we actually turn these frustrations into some kind of recognizable, and I don't like this word, but capital for ourselves? In other words, how do 
we research what we see happening around us and then contribute this to the broader kind of questions about it. So these are challenges and opportunities. Student buy-in, common baseline, no common baseline skills, time pressed. Uh, students see value in tech. Uh, there's place to build skills systematically. We can work together to redefine the community cu curriculum. Blended learning offers us the opportunity to deal with this, but it also offers us challenges. And the question really is, how do we deal with these? Okay, I don't have the answer, okay? But the reason why we are in tertiary space is we don't know the answers to everything, okay? We are willing to grapple with that, and what we need to do is find ways that we can connect with each other and say, okay, how can we work together? I'm not even posing solutions, but just grappling with questions instead of just bashing our heads against the wall. And my... my role in this project is to see how I can help facilitate those kind of connections and conversations. Okay, I'm not going to give you any answers because that is not my job. Najma here is not going to tell you how to blend, it, blend your learning either, but she's going to offer you frameworks, how to think about it. But as we talk to each other, I think things will start clicking into place and you'll understand things. And, and the job is then, okay, how can we develop momentum? How can we carry on doing that here in this group? But how can we involve our colleagues around this? And how can we broaden this out? I just have a, can yes. ask a question. Um, I mean, being a, a university of technology, I, I don't know what the weighting is, of, you know, the, the teaching and research, because the research universities focus a lot on on the research part and not so much on teaching and learning. And in your space, um, do you get rewarded for research or is the focus more on the teaching? For research. Yeah. And teaching and learning? No. No. They're trying to make us a research university. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of people who are now graduating, so I'll only know now that they also get money for that. Yes. Uh, I was very really surprised um, about it. So it's, like, the, the other thing is what was bothering me here, it's like you get double breasts if you do research, because first of all, my teaching load is much less than anybody else's. And secondly, if I now do whatever, I can get money for it. And I'm, I'm really just asking that question because, um, the work that I've done with other academics at research universities, research intensive universities, there's a lot of focus on the research part. So, so um, Jane made the point earlier about you are you do research in your particular discipline in your area, but not so much on teaching and learning. And we've also found that you know in our work with academics that um, there's not much of a focus on the teaching and learning and researching your own teaching and learning practice. And and I think that is what you are trying to establish here with those yes. communities of practice. And it's very difficult and it because of it is because of funding issues, promotion issues and all of that. That's why I wanted to know how do you get promoted and and, and you know recognized. You don't get
Maar ga ik, de pili van kakkerbjes, als je dit wil, die schat hebben krijgt, dus je kan dit te maken. Zo, de hand te maken. But I'm sure there is a policy. There is, as well. I mean, but in our faculty, there is. It's, it's, but it, I mean, it's just research based. There's nothing that you know. It's not like if you are outstanding in teaching and learning, you can, yeah. It means nothing. Uh, however, you you spoke about this con teaching and learning conference coming up, and there would be some recognition. Yeah, there's a rate awards. That's a separate thing from the teaching and learning conference. Okay. The rectress award for teaching excellence. And um, you all know about that, and you enter that, and you get a substantial um, award there, also monetary awards for teaching and learning. Mm. But they are right, it's not in the policies. Okay. But I think with the... But, so they're working towards that? They work, working because they first um, consultatively with the lecturers and the faculties wrote a new teaching and learning policy. Mm. So the next thing is to get a blended learning strategy accepted in everybody to be consultatively, collaboratively working on that strategy to give the inputs and then get that formalized. And then you go down to the processes and procedures. How do people get, you know, the, all of those things will come as the next level of transforming the whole institution. Yeah. But so at the moment, they're coming. quite right yeah. with what they're saying. It's not recognized. But coming back to Derek's thing, I can just say what, um, the opportunities that maybe I'm thinking in my head is that we're going to appoint the practicalities, not ideas. The ideas should really come from the lecturers. I don't want to put ideas of how we should start the COP or how we should get the students that the lecturers can give to Derek. But I can just talk about the opportunities maybe. And that is that we are appointing two students to um, sort of like engage with students and teach students about Rutella, okay? So they start in now November, right? For the beginning of November. So they could also be helping Derek to facilitate meetings with students. So the students that are involved in the pilot, your students in this module that's been identified, even if they were students from last semester or whatever, but to get them together through those two students for helping Derek so that he can give them surveys or interrogate or meet with them or whatever. That is one possibility with those students working closely with him on the student engagement project, to get the student's voice in this project. And then the other possibility is also yesterday, I also introduced Derek to a professor here. He was the ex-dean of the medical faculty of Wits, Prof Wadi. And he runs this research. He's, um, he's being appointed by BUT to increase the doctoral throughput that pipeline of doctoral throughput and master's throughput of students and staff. So if there are, if Najwa's going to talk maybe later a little bit about participatory action research, learning design research, those types of things, and then I spoke to him and then he is willing, if Derek starts this community of practice, well it's already started as he says, but he formalizes it in a way that he communicates with you regularly and whatever he does, and then if he sees there's needs for us to run more extensive workshops to find out more about the different research methodologies like PAR or whatever will suit this type of scholarship of teaching and learning research, then that professor can then run those technical workshops in it for us. So that's also another possibility. So we are giving you a research professor and we are giving you students to assist and we're giving you a coordinator so you can get the research going and you can get the student voice there. But how you do it, it's up to you and Derek to come up with the processes exactly how you will follow. Are you <laughs> So maybe um you can write emails then to or something or how would you look, of the Look I, for me there's there's a range of different ways that we can do this. Uh, we could do this uh, via a whole lot of emails. Uh, we could uh, arrange a, a couple of kind of brown bag face-to-face -face meetings where we we'll all get together with our lunch and talk around these things. We could uh, create space 
on Butella, where we would engage in these kind of conversations. I, I can't, I, the, the nature of a, a community of practice is it depends where you guys are at. Okay, so I don't want to say come to my place. I want to say where are you at the moment and where would be a convenient and, and workable space for us all to engage with each other. And also online meetings. So, so maybe we want to all do this on Skype. Maybe that's the place. Maybe what you want to do is you actually want some practical experience on Vutella doing this community of practice stuff. And so we say, okay, we're going to be talking about this in an okay, asynchronous fashion. In other words, not, not exactly at the same time, in an asynchronous fashion using forums. And we all go to Vutella and we use forums and then we practice that. And then we want to then have a, a space on Vutella where we actually do a webinar where we have chat at the same time. But again, it gives you the opportunity to practice with that. And okay, but do you, do you understand what I'm, I'm saying? These choices are, are huge. I like rich face-to-face -face workshops like this. I, I think they, they, they're very satisfying. Do we have in our schedule two days to spare uh, to do those things? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, maybe, maybe I should have this open to a questionnaire and we should actually send this round to everyone yeah. and, and we say, where would you like to, to do this? Uh, this is also collaborate. Sorry? We can yeah vote and, and get people to to decide where it really works for them. We've got all of the emails. We can send a little thing out later, and then through the workshop, and at the end of the workshop, during the duration, we can get the answers. Yeah, I mean part of part of what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be putting together a regular email where I will be talking about all of these things to you guys. And it will be kind of introducing these themes that I've talked about and hopefully inviting you to participate and inviting you to also maybe do some tasks which work towards some of these, these issues. Um, but again, the question is where do you want to do these tasks? Do you want to do them together here or do you want to do them online? If we're going to go blended learning, how familiar are you with the technology? I hear certain people say they're very happy with their their set of skills. Other people are saying, oh, we don't have enough time to, to practice. We need training. My feeling is training is fine, but in actual fact, what makes us learn about technology is when we have to apply our minds to the technology, and you don't want to know how to do something. I don't have to say, click here, click here, click here. You can teach that yourself, but when we can give a meaningful activity around those technologies, then people start to learn at the same time. The other part of what Gary has also contracted to do is the 30 people, the 15 year and the other 15 that's going to attend the next round of deployment workshops, those 30 pilot lecturers will be attending the first round of the facilitation course with Nachma and then where she's creating the blended learning facilitation module and she's going to, remember what we spoke about yesterday, she's going to have the, um, that only starting one week in this, um, she's going to open it up in December, beginning of December, and running it until the end of January, an online course. So at least just one week on that online course, she's ex we are asking you to spend online for this year. So, but you won't be meeting face to face with them. But then the other lecturers who are co facilitating those modules with you, Gary will, will be taking them through that module that Najma is creating also for the others that make up the 100 because there's all in all about 98 lecturers that are involved in this city model. So the remaining um, 70 or whatever, 68, the remaining 68 will then be going with Derek through that. And I don't want to call it training because Derek despises the word training. <laughs> so we call it applying their minds to that module. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You are such a diplomat. <laughs> Maybe just to very quickly recap, um, we spoke about the 
implement a nimble framework? Is there, and so when you do your activities, um, we hoping that well, I'm hoping that you can go back to this and and then let all of this inform. The, I mean, that's the idea of doing this inform uh, the way you uh, design your activity. So it's about the notions of learning. Do you just want them to acquire, or do you want them to participate? I am so bad with the sorry. I keep on doing this. Uh, yeah. So do you do? You, is it just about acquisition, participation, and contribution? Um, and if it is just about participation, then how are you going to use the technology just to disseminate or instruct? Okay, disseminate information. And that would be at, at the bottom of, your, of Bloom's taxonomy. And just for, um, for the benefit of our colleague that, that uh, um, uh, uh, joined us today, uh, what's our colleague's name over there? Courtney. Courtney, um, So we, we, this is the framework that I'm proposing and it, it does not mean that you strictly have to stick to this, but there are just some uh, um, ideas that might help to inform how you uh, then design and develop your, or develop and design your activities, which we're going to do uh, hopefully before lunch still. We'll start with that. So, you, so those are just things to think about. When you design, what am I designing? What do I want my students to do or be able to, you know, um, like value uh, at the end of your module? We also looked at different models for learning. Is it just reproductive, interactive, conversational, or transformative? Are we trying to, I think Derek also touched on that, do we, are we just wanting to replicate what we do in the classroom? Do we want to replicate that online? Do we, and we spoke a lot about the blend yesterday. What are we blending? What exactly are we blending? What are we doing face to face? What are we doing online? So how are we using the tool? Um, it, do we want to replicate or do we want to transform? And it's very, very difficult to transform, but I think it's important that we think about those things. Um, then, Bloom's taxonomy, we had a discussion about that and people were saying, yes, we understand that they need to apply and analyze and evaluate and create. But at the end of the day, we are required to get 80% through. Um, at the end of the day, they, we need to, it's about the throughput, we need to get 80%. And the reality is that they can't apply, they can't analyze, they can't do those, uh, the higher order thinking skills. Although we, we acknowledge that it's, you know, it's needed and we want the critical thinkers, but our reality is that we, we're not getting there. And if we do that, if we're going to set our activities that way, we're not going to get the 80% throughput that's required. And, I, and, and maybe if I can just get your thoughts on that, Kudne? For myself, For yourself. we keep things on, they can do it, but we never keep things on. Okay, so um, when we do the actual activities, we, we um, will come back to this and we look at what is possible and how we move them to the next level. Okay, we're not saying move them from remembering and I'm not saying that you're only testing remembering and understanding uh, at this point, but let's see how we can get them to the next level. Okay. So we've looked at the review tool. I, I will give you a copy, Courtney. I'll give you a copy of this review tool. This is um, useful when you design your material or your activities. It's also useful when you then um, review your activity. So you will have an opportunity to, to create the activity. I will come around. We can look at, uh, at this tool, the review tool which is this, the printout. No, it's not that. Anyway, we will look at that printout and then we will look at your activity and we will then try to see how it, it, it compares to 
that um, the uh, what those questions there? Have you considered all of those things? We've looked at that video. This learning spiral here. Um, this is basically all it's saying is that you start with, con if you look at the top, content based on prior knowledge and experience. Um, we spoke about that yesterday. We, we're saying that you're building on something. Your students don't come here with nothing. They come with experiences. They come with, with, um, with a history. And we've got to build. We've got to see where they are. Okay, we talked a lot about who our students are. So what are they coming with? You build on that experience and that is how you design your activity, taking into account who your students are. You then give them the guided reflection, which is there. That guided reflection on activity, um, discussion of issues raised in the activity. You can say this is the activity you kind of scaffold it for them. You can't just give an activity and say, do this. You've got to scaffold it for them and you've got to mediate it. And, and the tool, the, um, if you think of Blackboard, Butella, that is a tool that you can use to scaffold it. Okay? So if you, let's say for instance, you're asking them to create a PowerPoint. I'm going back to the PowerPoint. I used that example yesterday. If you create asking them to create a PowerPoint, what are some of the resources or the tools you can give them to help them make the PowerPoint? Let's let's say they've never used PowerPoint. What are, how would you mediate that? How would you give give that guided reflection? Can we, can we ask how, is it our ICT. IT? ICT. Okay, it doesn't have to even be the PowerPoint. It could be another activity. If you're asking your students to come and give an oral presentation, or you're asking them to go and research something, go and interview, Okay, you, you've got um, postgrad students. If you're asking them to go and interview somebody, what tools would you give them? So what we do in our research group, our students present, and then we criticize, and the rest must listen. Um, what are we telling them? For instance, it must be visible. Mm. Well, that's a big problem, just getting the text visible. There must be spelling errors. Uh, chemistry, there's very specific ways of showing things. You can't write how to capital It must be three for it. It must be done, and it's, it's not negotiable. Mm. Your units must be in a particular way. You will be teaching while they are actually doing it. Okay, so while they are doing it, you're giving the, them that kind of guidance. And also, they're very unskilled ones. You, you sit with them in your, in your um, office and say, this is how you do it, and you show them, and they're going to do it. And they also help each other. So yeah. you stay out till tomorrow. Once you can do it, go talk to somebody if you're very good at this particular aspect. That's great, because um, if, if you think of Vygotsky, if you think in terms of con social constructivism, and you think um, we're saying we want people to collaborate, and we're saying also, so I think you mentioned ZPD yesterday, Zone of Proximal Development. So students are here. Where are they currently? They they're at this point. How do you get them to the next point? By interacting with um, like what you call the expert. But the expert could be, it's not just you as the, as the facilitator or the academic or the, the lecturer. It could also be a more knowledgeable student. Yeah. It's a more knowledgeable other. And that other could be the student as well. So it's so I'm glad that you're saying, you know, go and speak to that one. That person can help you with this particular thing. Because what I said, I have to talk to some on XME how to interpret the results, and that is now going to say that was three, four years ago. Yeah. And now it's a little bit helping. They are helping, so it's helping each other. So it's less stress on me. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, 
coming back to the guided reflection. The reflection is also kind of after the fact, so after they've done the activity to reflect on it, because it's not only, it's not enough to just engage, but with that engagement, there has to be some kind of reflection. And, and just to come back to Vygotsky, he says that there are two principles. So you, you learn through interacting with others, so socially you learn, but then the second step is to internalize it. So, so on your own, you then think about it, you, you try to make sense of it, because yes, we can all talk and talk and talk, but if you don't internalize and, and then build on what you already know and make those connections, if you don't make those connections, then it's just going to leave you. But by the time you leave here, later on, it's gone. And that's often how it works with the students, because we don't give them the time to reflect yeah. on those activities and that we give them. And they also say that um, in reflecting, making them think about thinking, the metacognitive. Absolutely. Because Vygotsky's thing is about functioning on the higher levels, mediating mm. on the higher levels of cognition. Mm. You know, so thinking about thinking. If we come to the PowerPoint, the people are just me, the two of us, we're working together. And she's criticizing me because I don't have all the content in there. That's still just on the lower level, mm. you know, mm. and I don't have maybe, but now if we think about thinking and we actually reflect later on, so we've got to make them think about, we've got to build their metacognition. So we've got to think now, why didn't I come across, not only because I don't have all the content covered, mm. but maybe I didn't arrange my ideas properly. Mm. So what about arranging my ideas in a logical flow? Things like that, that is now the higher level of thinking of creating a PowerPoint. Mm. So that's what we've got to stimulate, metacognition. That's where tool mediation comes in. PowerPoint is the tool, but is it mediating learning, learning real learning, deeper learning, thinking about thinking? Absolutely, that's, yeah. that's, that's very nice. <laughs> you also mentioned that pathway. We have to think of that learning pathway. We're saying, so after the guided reflection, then you have the new, hopefully, new knowledge or new ideas leading to uh, then another. So you build on your activity. So it's got to have that learning pathway. You, c you can't start there and then you come down here. So this, this sort of a learning pathway that you, so you build on ideas because you're starting with what they know and you want to build that and, and take it to the next level. So you've got to consciously think of that learning pathway. And, and the thinking about the thinking is, is, is an excellent way of doing that. And we're going to look at some of the tools. And, and maybe just to um, give you an example of how we try to use that. Um, I've, I've worked with a, a, a lecturer. And we got his students to, to think about their own thinking. That was the first thing. The second thing was to make it a bit more personal because often we, we focus only on the cognitive, but we, we ignore the, the emotional side of it, the feelings, the um, affective. We, we tend to ignore that. And so we wanted to bring the two together, and we used the journal tool to do that. So what the students had to do was they had their weekly readings. At the end of that particular week, they used the journal tool to reflect on what that particular, whatever the content was of the reading, how, what that meant to them. And the content, the, 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 the discipline lent itself very well to that. So you have to think about in your discipline how you can do that. But that was actually for social work. And it was on um, HIV and AIDS and, and sexual behavior. So it was a very um, private and very sensitive topic. And so we use the journal too because the journal is private, okay? Uh, only the lecturer and the student can see it. Uh, and it was Blackboard that we use. Um, 
and I had to get permission from the students to get access to what they, they write in these journals because it was very, very private thoughts and ideas that they shared. Um, but you cannot believe what came out of that, really. But the, what it meant to the students was, was just amazing. We, we actually wrote an article on, on that and we got permission from them. And, and maybe then to just touch on the PAR work, uh, and I am going to talk about it later, but this is a perfect opportunity for you to, to think about those things. If you want to start um, researching your practice, you're creating and designing and developing your, your modules now in a different way, in, in a blended learning sort of way. And maybe this is a, an opportunity for you to now re, to look at what you're doing. Have PAR is all about cycles. So you 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 um, plan something, you implement it, you review it, and then you go and uh, redesign it based on 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 your review or your evaluation or your assessment. So that cycle can start now already. And you can easily do it with, with the instructional designer. I mean, it's not something that you can do. Uh, it's not something that you have to do on your own. You can collaborate. You don't even have to just collaborate with. You can have this, this group um, as, as research partners where you design this module that, that's been identified. You then, so you're doing the planning now. This is part of the planning. You go and implement it next semester. At the end of the semester, and you can get, you can, you can get different ways of, of um, evaluating it. You can get your students to um, complete a questionnaire. You could interview them. You could um, ask the person that's maybe team teaching with you. Um, you know, to, to also give their input, or the tutor, or the assistant, or the instructional designer. Um, so basically what I'm saying is you can already start the PAR process if, 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 if that is something that you wanted to do. And it's not just about the research recognition, but it's about, remember we said, doing things better and doing better things. So you're already hopefully doing better things, you're doing something different now, but this is the first round. And so you can reflect on it and then try to, in the next round, the next implementation round, make a few changes, evaluate that, and so on. OK, I'm, I'm going to ask, are, do we have anybody here that, that thinks that is an option or that would be interested in doing something like that? <coughs> Would it be possible? <coughs> research. It's not something that you plan in part of it. It's, it's intensive, intensive planning. Or else you're going to end up with stuffy, quadrilly things. Um, I, I haven't read in pedagogical stuff. I'll clue this and that in. And so teaming up with someone to do that, somebody would that not? Somebody that established in an area. It's not not three years ago. Anyone else that that maybe the are there any takers? I heard this um, somebody yesterday. You were. They were saying, you're interested in doing research. Would something like that interest you? Oh, oh that part. Yeah, that part. Yeah, I think it will help. It would it be very interesting to, to see how it will work. But the problem is time. The time around it is the problem. 
because you, yeah. I think the majority of us, the problem is we don't have time. As much as we don't have time to start creating more tests and doing that, I think if such things can fall away, we would have more time to be more active in creating mm. things that will assist us. Okay. So can I, can I maybe just pose the question? How, how do you ensure that what you do this year you improve on next year or the next time you implement. Isn't it something you're doing already anyway? Already it's things we are doing right now. We are looking at enhancing, making it better for students already. I was telling my colleagues that we actually can put, do extra things mm. and we feel that it will improve probably how students learn and it will probably help or enhance them in getting the skills mm. because if already we are looking at the learner guide is on blackboard the students don't mm. read it yeah so already i've picked up something that we probably can try to implement to actually force students to read the learner guide mm. i don't know uh we'll see how that works with okay so yeah. you you use the uh the term probably a few times to say we've seen this we're going to try that, probably is going to have that, uh, or is going to do this, that, or the other. So how about just collecting the evidence? Because that is all that you need to work in, is to start collecting the, the evidence. And how would, you be, how would you know that what you've done now, the changes you've made, has made a difference? Um, you're saying probably, right? the only time you so, know is the results. Or again, also, I think uh, there's, a, there's a part in Blackboard that allows you to see if students have accessed or the attempts they've uh, done, or probably if they've done something. So I think that would be the evidence if students do it. Okay. For me to say, now hence I say probably. Because yeah. if I say now and say no, students will do it. I can't yeah. do something like that. Yeah. Hence we say we need to find a mechanism that allows for us to somehow force students to do a certain Thing on mm. the course okay. And that comes back to exactly what I said yesterday. Mm. I always think, what's in it? Mm. Why should I do this? Right. What benefit do I get from this? Yes. Is there a mark for reading the learner guide? Mm. That kind of stuff. Mm. Otherwise, the students will do absolutely nothing. Mm. I posted an assignment which is actually a, an exam preparation for them, and I linked it to a mark. Mm. And they all asked me, when is the submission date? And I said, it's not a submission assignment. It's mm. there for you to gauge whether you are ready for the exam. Oh, mm. yeah, <laughs> that's okay. it. None of them opened it any further. Mm. Mm. Because it, it's not relevant to their year mark. Mm. So. Maybe you could put the exam paper online and have it in your screen. Yeah. Yeah. I did the same thing. I, the same I put a question on Blackboard. Yeah. Put it the same way on the test the following week. No one saw it. Mm. Mm. There's a copy and paste. Listen, mm. I gave them the test. I gave them 40 minutes in class to do the test. We then went, I put the memo on the board. We went through the memo. I explained it to them. Two weeks later, I gave them the exact same test and they got more than the test. So you <laughs> No, but that's a question. You tell that's, me. Yeah, that, you is, tell that is the nature of research. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you agree, do you, maybe I should ask, do you agree with that kind of, you know, the spiral there? You start based on prior knowledge and experience. Do you agree with that in principle? So how, how, do, you, how do you judge or how do you know where they are? How do you know this is where they are? And these are the experiences they bring with them. Because if, if you're starting with that and you're basing your activities on that, how do you know that first part? Where do you get that from? Because every year the students are quite similar. Each batch are a bit different. The dynamics in the class are different. But in general, they've got the same misconceptions and they've got the same well, for, for, for our side, I think because we always get first-year students every year. Yeah. So first content in 
class, when you start and you meet and greet introductions. Uh -huh. already, so you do that. We need to pick up, okay, which of the students either do have knowledge of using a computer and which don't. From there, that's when you know how you tackle that particular group or that class. Mm. That's how we would start off. So I don't know if it's different with other modules or mm. whether it's different with practical okay. or theory subjects. Yeah, because I wanted to make that suggestion now to say to you that when you start your module next year and you just pose that you a couple of questions, but you can just have that introductory uh, uh, conversation. You, you post a discussion and you say, you introduce yourself. This is who I am. A lot of lectures do, you know, a whole thing about this is what I am. This is my teaching and learning philosophy, not in very academic terms, just plain language mm -hmm. that students can understand. Th these are my expectations. This is how we're going to work in this particular module. They just give that sort of introduction and a little bit about themselves, just to bring in the personal touch. And then they say, and, 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 and is that what you do? Then you ask your students to introduce themselves because not all of them know each other, they, and especially your first years. And, and that's how you can gauge some of that. The other way um, that for instance, WITS is doing part of a, a project that we're doing with them, is a Pumalela project where we we um, trying to help students to no, 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 I'm listening. Oh, oh. Just I'm active. to help <laughs> them um, to <laughs> succeed. It's called the, the, the not the road to success one, but it's it's helping students to succeed, but to 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 get to get the evidence. So it's 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 got to do with learning analytics, you know, collecting evidence so that we don't say probably or just have the anecdotal evidence or the anecdotal stories that we think, okay, this is what students need or this is where they are. So it's, it's about evidence-based approaches and, and, and you can read up on it, uh, everybody's going that route. It's a very controversial subject because there's lots of ethical implications in you know, collecting data from students all the time and that kind of thing. But um, sorry, uh -huh. I just want to say something well, I think maybe in the facilitation module as well, the online facilitation, we could sort of like give them a lecturer's toolkit, mm. you know, to guide, to help them with that. There's that type of reference that you could read with it. With the guided reflection, there's mm -hmm. the bonos skills of mm. reflecting that you could give this to the students to make them reflect on the, with wearing different hats or whatever. Yes. You know, yes. There's, there's lots of um, theoreticians about reflection, teaching mm. them reflection skills. But in the cycle, giving mm. them toolkits mm. along the way in that mm. module. Absolutely. Um, so just coming back to that, so th it's, it's about collecting evidence. And you spoke about mm. Um, the, the analytics in, in Blackboard, that's already giving you some sort of indication. Okay, there's an, in Blackboard there's an early warning system. So you can set up rules, you can set up uh, uh, um, uh, warnings for students to say, you know, you haven't logged on in, so, in, in, in the last couple of weeks or whatever. There's all of those things that you can bring in. And, and hopefully when you sit with uh, the other group, they can, they can take you through all those things. So we're going to start just your activities today. And we're going to somehow try to create a learning pathway. Okay, and we're going to try and start with what they know based on <coughs> previous years. Like you say, there, there are a, kind, a, a few differences based on the group that you have in front of you. But there are also generic stuff that, that you work with and, and help as a guide. So we'll do that. But I'm, I'm suggesting that at the beginning of the year, you try and get some sort of uh, uh, information from your students. You can use the analytics. So already, you are collecting evidence. You can give them a very short two, three answer survey to do. That's part of the... Uh, you can use the survey tool or the or even the um, quiz tool 
just to ask them three questions. So you start collecting your data. But, but it's not just about collecting data, meaningless data. Just give it some thought. When you design this, think about what are the kinds of uh, uh, input that you want from, from students and from maybe a tutor or a, a colleague. And, and try and work that in. And when you do have the time, and if you do find the time, you could then start your, your article. Um, yes, you said you want to work with somebody that's done some work. I wish I could, I've, I've done lots of work in the field, but unfortunately I won't be able to, you know, kind of work with you. But even if you do it with a colleague at another institution, and you come, this is what we do here, this is what you do there. Let's see, are there similarities, are there differences, who are you, you, your students, who are my students, and, and that kind of thing. Sorry, just evidence, is there is this to test how much or how they would like to learn, or is this in general or subject specific, to find out what is the current knowledge about your subject? Is that it, it depends on what you want to do. Okay. So it could be to advance knowledge in the field. It could be to, to improve on your own practice. It could be just to improve your module, okay? So this is how I did it now. This is how the learners did this time round. Maybe I should change this, that, the other. We do the changes, implement it, reflect on it again, and, and that's, that's what PAR is about participatory action research. You you um, actually reflecting on your own practice and you're trying to improve it. And that's what you do anyway. I'm sure. Research, I'm, I'm sort of doing it. Um, they said discussion. Is it is a blackboard too or like a I mean this type of thing? Or is um, social media the best one for the for discussion? So they were logging what's the um, frequency people go to each type of discussion, yeah. what's the links of the um, variety, and it appears as though people still prefer like, Blackboard, like, uh, Facebook, because they don't go to any case. Mm. And now they go to the any case and then they also see the list. Mm. With, with Blackboard, they only go there when it's, so there's like a comparative study mm. compared to types of discussion forums. Exactly. You could do you know, within the, the LMS and, um, and maybe social media. It could be Twitter, it could be Facebook, it could be any other tool. It could be a blog, the, your open source blog, and then a blog in, 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 um, in Blackboard. And you just... I can't both and people don't discuss. <laughs> and, and then you reflect on implications for your practice. You know, um, and and how you can improve your blo uh, your um, module going forward. Okay. okay, so let me move on. We've already done this. What are we blending? For what purpose? And why? Why would your students? And it comes back to uh, um, that question of what's in it for the students. Um, there's an activity. Uh, it's five past eleven. Um, I'm checking if there's some. Um, we were meant to have tea, but can we do that again? Like we did yesterday, where it's just, you just grab, we just have a comfort break, five minutes. You can grab a cup of coffee, you can go to the ladies' room and whatever. And then we'll, we'll start with this. And then I want to, us to start the acti your activities before lunch time, because um, there isn't much to do after. In fact, that's the last activity. Okay, so five minutes. Comfort break.